I invite you to remain standing out of respect for the gospel reading today, which comes to us again from John's gospel today from the 11th chapter. John writes, A certain man, Lazarus, was ill. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and his sister Martha. This was the Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent word to Jesus saying, Lord, the one whom you loved is ill. When he heard this, Jesus said, this illness isn't fatal. It's for the glory of God so that God's son can be glorified through it. Jesus loved Martha, her sister, and Lazarus. When he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed where he was. And after two days, he said to his disciples, let's return to Judea again. The disciples replied, Rabbi, the Jewish opposition wants to stone you, but you want to go back? And Jesus answered, Aren't there 12 hours in the day? Whoever walks in the day doesn't stumble because they see the light of the world. And whoever walks in the light does not stumble because the light is with them. He continued, Our friend Lazarus is sleeping, but I'm going in order to wake him up. The disciples said, Lord, if he's sleeping, he will get well. They thought Jesus meant that Lazarus was in a deep sleep, but Jesus had spoken about Lazarus' death. So Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died. For your sakes, I'm glad I wasn't there so that you can believe. Let us go to him. Then Thomas, the one called Didymus, said to the other disciples, Let us go too, that we may die with Jesus. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Bethany was a little less than two miles from Jerusalem. Many Jews had come to comfort Martha and Mary after their brother's death. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him while Mary remained in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask, God will give you. Jesus told her, your brother will rise again. And Martha replied, I know that he will rise in the resurrection on the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me will live even though they die. Everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She replied, Yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ, God's Son, the one who is coming into the world. After she said this, she went and spoke privately to her sister Mary. The teacher is here and he is calling for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to Jesus. He hadn't entered the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. And when the Jews who were comforting Mary in the house saw that she got up quickly to leave, they followed her. They assumed that she was going to mourn at the tomb. But when Mary arrived where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and she said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. When Jesus saw her crying, and the Jews who had come with her crying also, he was deeply disturbed and troubled. And he asked, Where have you laid him? They replied, Lord, come and see. And Jesus began to cry. The Jews said, See how much he loved him? But some of them said, he healed the light, eyes of a man born blind. Couldn't he have kept Lazarus from dying? Jesus was deeply disturbed again when he came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone covered the entrance. And Jesus said, remove the stone. 
Martha, the sister of the dead man, said, Lord, the smell will be awful. He's been dead for four days. And Jesus replied, Didn't I tell you if you believe, you will see God's glory? So they removed the stone. And Jesus looked up and said, Father, thank you for hearing me. I know you always hear me. I say this for the benefit of the crowd standing here so that they will believe that you sent me. Having said this, Jesus shouted with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out! And the dead man came out, his feet bound and his hands tied and his face covered with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, Untie him and let him go. Therefore, many of the Jews who came with Mary and saw what Jesus did, believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated. Well, I want to start out today with a quick little quiz. See how awake everybody is. Whose portrait is on the front of a $1 bill? <laughs> a couple of my young people are going to raise their hands and answer me. Nobody else knows? Whose portrait is on the front of a $1 bill? <laughs> Thank you. Yes, George Washington, the first president of the United States. Well, if you have a $1 bill on you right now, will you take it out? Now, I promise you, this is not some kind of sly trick to take up an extra offering. <laughs> If you don't have a $1 bill with you, you might want to, you probably have your phones with you, you might want to look up a picture. I want you to look at that image. The man who painted Washington's portrait was a famous artist who, like me, had two first names. His name is Gilbert Stewart. He painted originally a life-size portrait of George Washington in 1795. That portrait is eight feet tall, five feet wide, and very detailed. Martha Washington was so impressed with that portrait that she commissioned a second portrait to be made of her dear husband in 1796. But the second portrait was very different from that first one. Stuart painted just the face of Washington and just a little bit of the background, and then he stopped. He said he deliberately left the painting unfinished. Did you notice that? His portrait is deliberately left unfinished. He said he thought that that would make it more interesting and intriguing and more valuable. And to prove his point, he made many copies of that portrait, and he sold them each for $100. That second unfinished portrait became so famous that it is the one that is used to represent our first president on that $1 bill. Now, I tell you this story because we are traveling through this 40-day season of Lent a period set aside specifically for Christians to reflect on the events leading up to Jesus' death and for us to get an idea of who Jesus is. And we have chosen this year to look very much at that question, who is Jesus? And we are using the statements in the Gospel of John known as the I Am statements to help us paint a portrait of who Jesus is. We have heard that Jesus is the bread of life. We have heard that Jesus is the light of the world. We have heard that Jesus is the gate or the door of the sheepfold and that Jesus is the good shepherd. Each one of these images is an unfinished portrait of who Jesus is. 
And today we are going to hear another piece of the portrait of Jesus' beautiful life and what his life, his death, and his resurrection means for each one of us. Next week we will hear another piece of the portrait. And the following week we will read the seventh statement that is given in John's Gospel to help us get a more complete picture of who our Savior is. Today, we have read from John's Gospel where Jesus declares, I am the resurrection and I am the life. The Gospel reading began with a report of his dear friend Lazarus's illness. And it goes on to describe Jesus finally arriving in the little town of Bethany where Lazarus and his sisters live. And Lazarus has already died several days earlier. His body has already been placed in a cave and sealed. But that was not the end of Lazarus' story. For Jesus raises him to new life releasing him from the grave. This text is so rich with so many meanings. It has a lot to say about family. It has a lot to say about friendship. It has a lot to say about prayer and waiting for God to answer. It talks about suffering it talks about grief. Did you notice how Jesus himself even wept? Jesus enters into our grief. It talks about doubt. It talks about hope. It talks about death. And it talks about dying. But most of all, this story about Lazarus is about the life-giving resurrection power of God revealed in Jesus Christ. And as our dear children so wisely said, it foreshadows Jesus' own resurrection power. This theme of resurrection is not new in John's Gospel. It's a theme that runs throughout all of Scripture. Listen as I read from the Old Testament Psalm 130, verses 1 through 2. It begins... Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplication. And the psalm goes on to speak about how God's forgiveness and God's unfailing love, even in the depths of sin and despair, God's forgiveness and God's full redemption is there, and new life can begin. New beginnings can start. In the book of Ezekiel, the prophet sees a valley of dry, dead bones. Mortal, how can these bones live, the Lord asks. And then the Lord provides the answer. Thus says the Lord to these bo bones, I will give breath to enter you and you shall live. Right before Ezekiel's eyes, the valley of bones comes to life and is assembled into a vast army. The resurrection power of God. The power of God to bring new life out of death and darkness and despair. Romans 8, that we used as our affirmation of faith today, talks about being dead to sin but alive in the Holy Spirit, dead to the way of life, but alive in righteousness. Death is replaced by life and peace. And that's the resurrection power of God at work in the here and now, not just at some point in the future. That's the power that Jesus displays when he raises Lazarus from the grave the power that Jesus claims for himself when he says, I am the resurrection and the life. The power that we see when Jesus is raised on Easter morning. Just before Jesus declares, I am the resurrection and the life, did you notice what Martha said to him? 
Martha said in verse 24, I know that my brother Lazarus will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Martha was part of a Jewish group that believed in the resurrection at the last day, at some point in the future. But how comforting do you think that was for her to hear from Jesus right then? Right then, she wanted Jesus to do something for her. I know that that will happen in the future, but right now my heart is breaking There are many verses in the Bible that remind us of the truth of resurrection in the future. And we talk about it every time we have a service of death and resurrection, a service, a memorial service, or a funeral service. We talk about that future hope of resurrection after death. And the scriptures do promise this to us. 1 Corinthians 6 says, And God raised the Lord and will also raise us by his power. 2 Corinthians 4 says, We know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus will also raise us with Jesus and will bring us with you into his presence. And 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 says, For the Lord himself would cry out a command with the archangel's call and with the sound of God's trumpet will descend from heaven and the dead in Christ will rise. These verses offer to us encouragement and comfort in the face of death. That death does not have the final word over us. Life does. We have a hope in that future resurrection. Grief and sorrow and pain and suffering will not be the end of us. Through faith in Jesus Christ, one day, resurrection will come after death on this side of heaven. So with Martha, we understand resurrection as a future hope. The best is yet to come. We will be reunited with all of those who have gone before us. But Jesus says, Martha, that's not all there is to it. For I am the resurrection and the life. Not I will be the resurrection and the life at some future point. Not let's wait until that future day for the resurrection and the life. In other words, resurrection and new life are not only for some future time, but resurrection and life can happen in the here and now. When you feel dead and dark and trapped and hopeless on this side of heaven, new life and resurrection is possible. Jesus went on to demonstrate that by raising Lazarus from the dead. Jesus went to the tomb and he told the people to remove the stone and he told Lazarus to come out and then he told the people to unbind him and set him free. My friends, this story reminds us that if we are in a dark tomb in life, a dark place of despair where we feel that we have been cut off from life on this side of heaven, that none of our situations are without hope when Jesus is with us. We may find ourselves asking in those dark and desperate times of life, Jesus, where are you? Why are you delayed in coming as Martha and Mary did that day? We may find ourselves in situations where we wonder, how could God have left this happen? When will resurrection come? But out of those depths of despair and doubt and darkness, Jesus is calling each one of us by name, just as he called Lazarus. And he is saying, come to me, come to me and enjoy new life and new hope. Be released from your fear, your disappointment, your anger, your loss, the daily grind of work, whatever it is that is weighing you down in darkness and despair. For resurrection and abundant life are not only a future hope, they are possible for you here and now.
possible for you here and now. Years ago, a friend of mine who had more of a scientific brain than I do was taking an oceanography class. And something very interesting happened in that class that spoke to my friend's faith. My friend said the professor came into the classroom one day and wrote on the board this phrase, the promise of light. And the professor went on to say that back in 1872, a guy named Charles Thompson got on a research vessel and went around the planet to all of the oceans trying to prove a theory. Here's the theory. At that time, he said, most scientists believed that all of life came out of the depths of the darkness of the ocean and it would rise to the surface until life came up on land. So Thompson wanted to see if that was true. And he traveled around the globe 69,000 miles to what was the deepest, darkest depths of the ocean to see what he could find. Did life evolve from the deepest darkness and rise up to light? Well, what he found was the reverse of that theory. Life, he said, was not created out of darkness rising to the surface. What he found is that in that darkness, it was really, really hard to live. If you've ever seen pictures of the deepest, darkest depths of the ocean, you'll see that all of the fish and shells and organisms that are in that deep darkness are pretty grotesque to look at. Their mouths are extra big and wide as they're groping for things. They're hungry in that darkness, searching, searching, searching. They're all distorted from the pressure of being down deep, so deep in the depths of the darkness. Grotesque figures in that darkness. My friend said, as he thought about that story and realized, that what Thompson found out is that all of life really begins in the light. For life, for each one of us, becomes grotesque and hideous when we live in the darkness and the oppression. It's hard for us to see hope when the darkness is all around us. But remember the message at Christmas? Jesus came as the light into the world. And the darkness cannot overcome the light of Christ. The promise of Christmas is that the light of Christ will bring light and life to all of us. And as long as we are present in that light, we will have life. We will have life. I want you to look at the front of the bulletin. Jane always picks a wonderful picture to kind of portray the sermon. And I don't think she even realized how profound this picture is. You'll see light emanating out of the darkness of that tomb. The light of Christ overcoming the darkness of death. The light of Christ overcoming the feeling of hopelessness and despair that death brings to our hearts. The light of Christ shining out upon us with the good news that we can experience resurrection here and now. Resurrection 
in the future for sure, but resurrection even now in the midst of all that we are going through. No matter whether we meet Jesus during the season of Lent or during the season of Easter, whenever we meet Jesus, Jesus comes to bring us light and life so that we may face the future unafraid. May we have the faith to so live as we answer that question that Jesus posed to Mary and to Martha, do you believe in me? In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.